and thank you all for joining us today. We are honored to have with us Professor Phoebe Kaundori. We're also lucky to have with us Professor Blundell from the UCL Econ Economic Department of Economics, and he has very kindly accepted to introduce Professor Kaundori. So without further ado, I hand it over to Professor Blundell. Thank you, thank you very much. Another great event uh, by the Economics Society. Always very proud of the uh, students at UCL and the Economics Society. And we're really delighted to welcome Professor Phoebe Kandori to UCL, I should say back to UCL. Um, uh, I, I, we just were talking and we'll confirm that um, Phoebe was here in around 1999, 2000, helping uh, with the environmental, uh, both uh, teaching and seminar and very involved. And I uh, want to welcome her and thank her for taking part in this uh, wonderful series of lectures that the UCL students have organized as part of their conference for 2020. A few words about Professor Kaundori, I'm making, if I get your name right. She, she is really a remarkable economist. I knew her earlier when she just finished her PhD at Cambridge, but uh, what is uh, fantastic about um, her work is her a brilliant ability to straddle many different areas of economics. It's very exciting to be able to do that. Many economists are very narrow in that respect, but she doesn't only do that. She brings them together with other disciplines to address um, some of the most important challenges facing uh, modern society, particularly, of course, the challenge of environmental sustainability. And I think we're gonna hear a, a lot more about, uh, about that. Um, she's published, of course, a wide range of highly cited research papers in the broad area of climate change, environmental sustainability. Um, but she's also taken a leading role in the development of the area in economics and recently elected or president elect to the European Association of Environmental Natural Resource Economists. I think that's right. And, and has been a founder and scientific director of the research lab on socioeconomic and environmental sustainability at Athens University, where she's also professor of sustainable development, I think there. Um, added to all of this, which is uh, really uh, a, a, a quite a remarkable story already, uh, she's taken a leading role in, um, in, in, uh, in policy and in policy leadership and influence in particular. I'm thinking of the co-chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Network and uh, chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the International Center for Research Environment and the economy. I'm looking down to make sure I actually read the titles of these things correctly. <laughs> so environmental agencies always have such long, uh, long names. Um, and of course, she has many other key policy advisory positions. Uh, so from that PhD in Cambridge and many interactions, it, it, in a nutshell, shall, uh, Professor Kalandori is really a role model for every young economist who wants to use their economics to change the world, the, the world we live in for better. Uh, so welcome here, and we're all very much looking forward to your, uh, to your uh, lecture. So thank you, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Richard. You were uh, one of my role models, and I am excited that you introduced me. Uh, I am also very happy to be talking to UCL students. And I was uh, just uh, before we were uh, at the backstage, I was uh, saying that it is absolutely necessary that you enjoy and absorb all that UCL is giving you. Um, it is, you're very lucky and privileged more privileged than lucky because you work your way to UCL to be at such a university, a university that has endorsed not just scientific excellence, but also women first from any other university uh, in the UK and um, diversity in all respects. I am really honored to be talking to you guys, really. 
so I'm gonna share my slide. I uh, my slides. I've prepared some slides because I think they will be uh, helpful in um, in following what I have to say. Um, and um, I hope you can see them here. I will uh, first uh, give you. A general introduction of the current state, let's say, of uh, what is going on with regards to um, sustainability transition. And my focus will be European, but I will uh, try to bring in global elements. At the end, I will give you a brief introduction to a, a cluster of institutions that I lead and um, I produce uh, research uh, and innovation work and deep demonstration work and uh, training and education activities in the area of sustainability. So these days I start on my uh, um, public uh, lectures with this uh, sketch, the three big crises that we are facing the pandemic and of course we try to control it with uh, social distancing measures and biomedical research the big economic recession that derives from the pandemic and uh, the acknowledgement that flattening the infection curve steepens the microeconomic recession curve and uh, the um, uh, discussion that is going on at all policy fora that on how we can avoid the pandemic turn into a major economic and financial crisis that will long outlast the health crisis. Because we know we need to keep the workforce employed, even in quarantine, we need to get the government's channel financial support to public and private institutions that support vulnerable citizen groups. We need to safeguard SMEs against bankruptcy. We need policies to support the financial system as no performing loans mount. And of course, we are constructing the governments and multilateral institutions are constructing fiscal packages which are comparable to the crisis related loss of GDP in order to reboot the economy. And uh, this will of course be financed by national debt, national debt that we've proven worldwide that we are not good in handling. That's another issue. Of course, the third crisis, and it is the mother of all crises, and it has been around and has been identified for uh, two or three decades now, is climate change. When we uh, refer to the climate crisis, we refer to the emergency of having to limit global warming to below plus 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius increase. That is the maximum increase in the average temperature that we can afford is plus 1.5 degrees Celsius. Beyond this uh, point, the risk of ex extreme weather events and poverty for hundreds of millions of people will significantly increase. At the moment, there is no country that is not experiencing the drastic effects of climate change. The annual average economic losses from climate related disasters are in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And unfortunately, 91% uh, of climate related um, uh, 91 effects of natural disasters are climate related and they unfortunately produce a huge death toll for more than uh, 1 million between 98 and 2017. And these climate related events also produce more than 4.4 billion injured. These are very serious effects. UNEP emission report that was published in 2019 indicates that global emissions need to be cut by 7.6% per year in order to be able to meet the 2030 target of um, agenda 
2030. This is the agenda of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and I'm going to come to them in the next slide. So 7.6% per year calculates to 68% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. This is huge, and it is not easy to reach. Let's see what we have um, on board in order to be able uh, to uh, make uh, our uh, transition. Um, give me one minute because I think I have uh, opened another slide. Um, I would prefer to uh, continue with uh, uh, this slide. So just bear with me. Uh, for a minute. Sorry about this. Okay, here we go. So how are we going to uh, do this uh, sustainability transition. First of all, let me uh, clarify what sustainable growth is. It is an organizing principle for meeting human development goals while sustaining the ability of natural systems to provide the natural resources and ecosystem services upon which the economy and society depend. Sustainability means environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and social sustainability. And in general, the definition that we have, and it's relevant for all uh, three elements of sustainability, environmental, economic, and social, is that sustainable development should meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. What do we have in place that will help us in this sustainability? Uh, so what kind of top-down mobilization do we have in place? Well, 2015, uh, September, New York, 193 countries signed the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals that refer to everything that has to do with the people, their prosperity, and the planet. Within these goals, we have 169 targets, and uh, meeting these targets is our uh, objective. The only global agenda at the moment uh, for 2030. A few months later, uh, Paris COP21, we have 197 countries signing the climate uh, agreement, which was an agreement to limit global temperature to well below two degrees Celsius increase. Since then, as the UN Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network publishes a report every year um, which indicates for each and every country their performance with regards to each and every of these 17 SDGs. For each SDG, there are targets, and for each target, there are indicators, and we measure the performance, the uh, achievement, the percentage of achievement of the goal in each and every country. In 2018, we have the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, uh, which um, produces a regular report uh, identifying the effects of uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions on global temperature and then the effects of the increase in global temperature on human life and the economy. And this report said that we cannot afford an increase of two degrees Celsius. We need to uh, re uh, restrain this increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. 2019 Climate Week, September, New York, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network um, uh, presents the six major transformations to achieve the SDGs. 
I was part of the SDG negotiation procedure. And I used to say that 17 calls are too much, too many for governments. Government need a few goals and quite explicit ones and um, goals that can be integrated into the way governments function. That's why in September 2019, we announced the six major transformations to achieve the goals. These transformations resemble the way uh, that governments are structured. And a lot of this work is due to the amazing work of Mariana Matsukato from UCL. Uh, these six transformations refer to education, health, um, decarbonization, sustainable food, land, water, and oceans, sustainable communities and cities, and the digital revolution for sustainable development. December 2019, we have the announcement of the European Green Deal. This was definitely a, a, a leadership uh, announcement, one of the, um, the most important European Green Deal um, uh, um, in, uh, announced first. And uh, the main axis of this uh, European Green Deal is uh, the commitment to 2050 climate neutrality, the commitment, uh, commitment to protecting biodiversity and human health and canceling out pollution, the commitment for clean, uh, from clean tech uh, leadership uh, for European companies and the commitment to have an inclusive transition to sustainability that is a transition that will leave no one behind. The European Green Deal has nine policies protecting biodiversity from fork to fork, sustainable agriculture, clean energy, sustainable industry, building and renovating, sustainable mobility, eliminating pollution and climate action. And the European Green Deal comes with a big budget. The uh, budget is one trillion, half of it to come from the multi-annual financial framework of the EU and EU emissions trading system and the other half to be leveraged by public-private partnership. Of course, an important part of it that is financed both uh, from the EU budget and leverage from public-private partnership is the just transition mechanism that is there to support the regions that will be heavily uh, influenced by decarbonization and uh, hence need additional help in order to uh, uh, be kept on a sustainable uh, pathway with uh, new opportunities for businesses and new growth models and of course major reskilling and upskilling of the labor force. 2020 we have the coronavirus we know that there is an inverse relationship between containing the pandemic and microeconomic recession and uh, we have uh, the European um, the European Commission but also other, uh, um, the IMF, uh, other multilateral institutions producing recovery and resilient funds. The recovery and resilient fund of the EU is called the EU Next Generation. It is an additional 750 billion uh, in the multiannual financial framework of the EU, and it has two explicit commitments climate mainstreaming and digital mainstreaming. Everything has to every investment that will be financed by this recovery fund should be climate mainstream and digital mainstream. And of course, all this, uh, the European Green Deal, the recovery fund has to be integrated in the process of the European, uh, the European semester process. This is a process where the European Union identifies where um, countries should further invest in order to meet uh, the criteria uh, of the European Union. On this end, I lead with uh, Jeff Sachs from Columbia University, a senior working group for the implementation of the European Green Deal and the simultaneous implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals 
um, the European semester process recommendations and the European Green Deal and the Recovery and Resilience Fund. So we try to put in one report all these policies and come up with recommendations for each of the 27 countries in the EU. We will say something about the UK as well, but the UK is uh, now with Brexit, a, a, a different situation. It is also important to recognize EU leadership on European Green Deal, but also understand that this is not the only thing that is happening. Canada has a pact for the Green New Deal and it was announced before the European Green Deal. South Korea has announced a Green Deal on July 2020. Israel has announced a Green Recovery Plan in June 2020. The US has a Green New Deal and the new president-elect has a firm commitment to the climate agreement and a green infrastructural recovery. And the biggest news of all, uh, for me, together with the U.S. Um, new elected president that is committed to sustainability is China's carbon neutrality announcement uh, on September 2020. They announced uh, that they will become carbon neutral by 2060. And, and of course, whether with, uh, with the top-down mobilization, we need bottom-up mobilization as well. We need to engage uh, with the uh, stakeholders, with all the stakeholders, in order to achieve uh, this transition. We need to co-design with the stakeholders the future vision and also co-design the pathway towards this future vision. At this point, I want to state explicitly that I am a firm believer that we don't need stimulus spending. We had stimulus spending since the great financial crisis and it has not worked. It has not worked for many reasons, but one of the crucial reasons, at least from my point of view, is that we need to transform our system. We need to transform uh, our system in a way that it gains better structure and functioning. So uh, what I engage in, um, and I try to integrate in, in the economics model is this systems innovation approach, which fosters integrated and coordinated interventions in economic, financial, political and social systems and along whole, along whole value change. So by means of relations, elements are arranged in such a fashion that gives rise to a new structure functioning. Uh, this uh, new structure fun functioning emerges after explicit um, a consultation with all relevant stakeholders. And this gives um, uh, the new structure that allows um, uh, triggering exponential change in decarbonization rates, strengthening climate resilience, but also uh, exponential change in all other areas of, uh, socio of the socioeconomic uh, system that is needed. As is uh, said in the IPCC report, we need rapid far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. And to do that, we cannot work with the old structure, with the silos and bottlenecks that the old structure brings. We need to transform our systems. And I hope that the recovery spending in uh, around the world will be transformative uh, spending, will uh, help us transform our socioeconomic and financial system towards a sustainable pathway uh, using sustainable development goals and the European Green Deal as our blueprints and not just trying to recover what we have before because what we have bef had before it was not sustainable and there is quite substantial scientific speculation that the pandemic is partly uh, due to uh, climate change and the uh, effects on uh, environmental degradation. Uh, cl um, climate change and environmental degradation 
um, led to reduce in, uh, in biodiversity and deforestation. And these uh, reductions uh, brought uh, very close together humans and wildlife. And this made it uh, much easier for zoonotic viruses to make the cross uh, species live. And you should know I am part of the new Lasset Commission on COVID-19 uh, uh, that is working on sustainable pathways for recovery. You should know that there exist 6,000 zoonotic viruses that can potentially make this cross species live. So unless we get our act together and become sustainable following the um, sustainability policies that are already there, we have the climate agreement, we have the SDGs, we have the European Green Deals, we have uh, Green Deals all over the world. We are facing um, the risk of these catastrophic events, um, other pandemics, but many other catastrophic events, floods, uh, uh, forest fires, uh, tsunamis, all these extreme uh, weather events to produce um, a lot of disasters, disasters that we cannot afford to have. You should understand that the climate change increases the intensity and frequency on natural catastrophe. And the only natural catastrophe that is not connected to climate change is earthquake. All other catastrophes are connected scientifically. Now, of course, we know that aggressive decarbonization will be needed beyond 2030 to keep the temperature increase below 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, we know that uh, global power demand will continue to grow and will grow by 62% uh, till 2050. But the good news is that we know that renewables will, are consistently cheaper than fossil fuels. Energy storage installations increase exponentially. Strong energy efficiency improvements are, uh, are possible. Large scale carbon uh, capture is possible and the transition to circular economy can produce um, a huge mitigation effects. Circular economy is one of the main drivers. Um, let me uh, try to convey what a circular economy is. It is not an economic model, it's a production and consumption model. And it uh, is guided in three principles, preserve and has natural capital by controlling finite stocks and balancing renewable resource flows. The second principle is optimize the resource yields by circulating products, components, and materials. And the third principle is foster system effectiveness by um, designing out negative externalities. And climate and a circular economy helps climate change because it designs out waste and pollution and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. It keeps products and materials in use and uh, to retain the embodied energy in product and materials. And it regenerates natural systems to sequester uh, carbon in soil and products. And it's good for the economy as well. It is estimated in our work that savings of 600 billion euro for EU business. This is 80% of their annual turnover. Um, it creates more than half a, a million jobs in innovative design and business models, research, recycling, remanufacturing, and product development. Uh, EU carbon emissions estimated 400 and 50 million tons by 2030. It reduces the environmental footprint and it's um, uh, so um, the public private partnership model is there and it's relevant because circular economy produces uh, private benefits in terms of profits to companies, but it produces a lot of public benefits uh, in terms of um, uh, reducing the environmental footprint of production and consumption, and in terms of uh, reducing pollution and increasing health benefits for people. 
And of course, uh, the um, European Commission has adopted the new circular economy action plan. It's one of the building blocks of the European Green Deal and it um, uh, concerns initiatives along the entire life cycle of products targeting, for example, their design, promoting circular economy processes for, the, for staring sustainable uh, consumption and aiming to ensure that the resources used are kept in the EU economy for as long as possible. The other major mobilizer is decarbonization. Each and every country in the EU has a national and energy climate plan, which shows how each country will reach the European targets of decarbonization. Lately, on the 17th of September, the president of the European Commission announced an increased greenhouse gas uh, emission target from 40% to 55%. This translates in the need of an increase in investment of 350 billion per year uh, for the countries, for the 27 countries in Europe. This is a huge uh, number, but it is also an agreed target within the European Commission. In addition to the target for decarbonization, we have the announcement of the sustainable growth strategy of the European Commission, where we have the European flagship for the technological pathways. So these are the technologies that will help us accelerate decarbonization and accelerate the transition to sustainability. First flagship power up, lay the foundations for the hydrogen uh, economy, renovate, improve the energy and resource efficiency of buildings, recharge and refuel, which means promoting future proof clean technologies, connect, that is provide universal access to rapid broadband services, modernize the UID and key digital public services, scale up, increase cloud capacities and develop powerful sustainable processors and very importantly reskill and upskill focus investments and reforms on digital skills and educational and vocational training for all ages this is important because we are going through the fourth industrial revolution the pace of technological is increase is unprecedented we don't even know whether the labor force can uh, um, keep up with the this pace can uh, be upskilled and reskilled on this pace, but this is certainly something that we need to invest in if we want the transition to happen, because you can have the best technology around. If you don't have the trained labor force to use it, then uh, this uh, technology is not very helpful in creating growth. One um, other mobilizer, which is of course very connected with decarbonization is the whole of the energy sector. The energy sector plays a key role in restarting the economy and in restarting uh, in a green way. So what needs to be done now is, is to set an ambitious agenda for job creation and climate change calls. We need to modernize energy systems that can contribute to job creation and economic growth without we, which also protect the climate. And here we need public sector leadership in investing in clean energy. We need governments to be involved because governments directly or indirectly drive more than 70% of global energy investments. Um, it is important to understand the huge effect on job creation. I refer to my good friend, uh, uh, the work of my good friend, uh, Robert Pauling uh, in the US who has uh, showed in input output table structures that 160 million jobs will be created globally and 4 million will be lost in the fossil fuel industry. With regards to Europe, we expect a net increase of approximately 17 million jobs in Europe. And uh, this, of course, again, takes us back to the need for capacity building for the transition 
uh, to happen. Uh, a third mobilizer after circular economy and decarbonization is, of course, climate change adaptation infrastructure. Adaptation programs like early warning systems, making infrastructure resilient, improving dry land agriculture, and so on, generate a triple dividend. They avoid losses due to climate change. They produce economic benefits from the investment programs and they produce social and environmental benefits. Finally, sustainable finance is crucial. Uh, in uh, 2019, the European Investment Bank announced that we'll end uh, financing for fossil fuels energy products, and it also announced that future financing will accelerate clean energy innovation, energy efficiency, and renewables. Relevant announcements were afterwards made by the European Central Bank, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, and also there is now a movement of national banks around the world that are endorsing sustainable um, finance uh, criteria. And all of this is also um, moving downwards in commercial banks. And an instrumental uh, report for the sustainable finance to uh, gain ground uh, was uh, the EU taxonomy that was published in 2019 by the European Commission. In, this is the um, a classification system for sustainable economic activities, which creates a common language for investors and lenders and allows scale up private and public investments to finance the transition to a climate neutral and green economy. At the same time, we have uh, instruments that try to change the behavior of companies and, um, and people. And these are mainly in terms of CO2 taxes and emission trading system. Over the last decade, we have 51 carbon pricing and emissions uh, trading systems implemented. You can see the graphs, you can see where they have been implemented. 25 of them are ETS, emission trading systems. 26 of them are um, uh, carbon taxes. And among the countries that have submitted um, as per the requirement of the climate agreement, they are nationally determined contribution. Uh, 88 uh, countries uh, around the world have stated that they tend to implement carbon prices as part of their national climate policies. At this point, I want to make sure that we get this right. Taxes and ETS are there to incentivize the transition from clean, from uh, dirty de technology to clean technology. This happens when the alternative technology is available at prices that are affordable. And they work better based on our work, uh, results from our work, when there is transparency, when there is no corruption, and when the money, the income from these taxes and ETS are earmarked for green development products. So uh, I'm saying all this just to make the case that uh, phenomena like the yellow vest that we had in uh, France are uh, not phenomena that are showing that carbon taxes are not good instruments. They are phenomena that indicate that when carbon taxes are inefficiently implemented, they can uh, produce um, many problems and solve uh, none. The EU ETS system is the largest multinational greenhouse gas emissions trading scheme in the world. It has been uh, functioning with some success, not the success that we envisioned in uh, 2000. It has been revised lately. And we now hope that uh, it will help the industry and the power sector meet the innovation and investment challenges of the low carbon transition via several low carbon funding uh, schemes. We've seen during the pandemic with oil, um, with the um, 
lockdowns that there was an oversupply of these emissions um, uh, uh, trading uh, permits and this of course uh, led to a problem in the system and indicated the, the need for a much more efficient market stability uh, reserve that is an efficient way to get uh, to um, reduce the uh, availability of permits when the demand for them is low. And of course, we need to keep in mind that when we are designing policies and transition pathways, we need to uh, measures to counterbalance the regressive effects of decarbonization policies. And these measures can come in lump sum transfers, a reduction in income taxes, target the energy efficiency measures and so on. One efficient um, uh, instrument, uh, one efficient instrument is transition bonds that has worked quite uh, impressively in the last few days. But in closing this presentation, I would like to say never waste a good crisis. Uh, we are at a point where the economic crisis is definitely more severe than the 2008 financial crisis and the energy technologies are there while the um, are more mature than before, but while the climate uh, challenge is uh, even more uh, pressing. So I would say that we need to invest on controlling the epidemic, but we also need to invest in renewable energy, circular economy, renovation um, in terms of buildings and infrastructure, cleaner transport and logistics, food security, smart agriculture, secure ICT, and strengthening just transition in terms of reskilling, upskilling, training, and building capacity for that transition. Thank you so much, Professor Kondori, for that interesting talk. I think it was really interesting to see how a circular economy can play an important role in climate action and how a just transition is essential to protecting communities that are most vulnerable to the effects of decarbonization. Since we're running out of time, um, I just want to move on to the question and answer session. Are there any live questions? To reiterate, if you wish to ask a live question, use the raise hand function present at the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. Shivam. Hello, uh, I'm audible. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, Professor, for the talk. So my question was actually surrounding the SDGs and the sort of initial portion of the presentation which you gave. So like initially you mentioned that uh, the 17 goals for SDGs may be too many for the government um, and maybe too many to tackle. And I also read about how there might be some trade-offs attached to that. Let's say, you know, economic development, primarily industrial development with environmental sustainability, for example. So what sort of challenges do you think this poses for um, international governments as well as policymakers? And how should they be thinking about uh, the situation while they're uh, tackling the sustainable development goals? Yeah, the, uh, the challenges are many. And the biggest one is uh, that um, the policy, the politicians, not just the policy makers, uh, do not understand the concepts. Uh, with uh, my work uh, with uh, Jeff Sachs, we've uh, met with politicians around the world, not just Europe trying to mobilize this sustainability transition. The idea of this um, United Nations Sustainable Development Network is that the solutions that are produced in universities and research institutions will be communicated to the other stakeholders that need to implement uh, sustainability. Who are these? The politicians, the policymakers, the civil society, the NGOs. Having um, a 10 year interaction with all these stakeholders, I think the biggest challenge is to understand the, 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 the basic framework of the SDGs, but also the European Green Deal. These are concepts that are not 
broadly understood. They are difficult, they are data hectic, they are science hectic, they are um, uh, quite demanding in, in, in terms of uh, who can understand it because it's a truly interdisciplinary. So you might even have a, a very well-educated person, an engineer, a mathematician, a, a sociologist that cannot bring everything together. And this is relevant for the citizens as well. So usually how it works, um, the citizens realize a problem and then they uh, create pressure, pressure on the politicians uh, through their vote and other means uh, to put a, an issue on the agenda. Uh, sustainable development was a very difficult issue to put in the agenda and it became easier, unfortunately, because we have all these uh, natural disasters that are, uh, that are related to climate change. Uh, it is unfortunate, but this is what has happened. So people, when they face a tsunami or forest fires or floods, the easier thing to do in order to raise awareness, understand it and, uh, and pressure in order to put it in the political agenda is just to make the case for the connection, the causality relationship between climate change and uh, this natural disaster. And also increase awareness with regards to what causes climate change. CO2 emissions, what produces CO2 emissions? Industry, your own consumption, uh, the inefficient use of water, of land. It is very difficult to convey all these issues because there is no real uh, educational tradition in this issue. There are no interdisciplinary uh, courses. There are some nowadays, but you don't have a history of interdisciplinary training that is needed in order to understand sustainability. And unfortunately, we don't have the time to do it right. We need to understand it fast and we need to uh, uh, take action now because we, we are already at plus 1.3 degrees Celsius and our target is 1.5. So it is good news that we are seeing all these uh, Green New Deals happening and we hope that they will be implemented. We have China, we have the US, we have Europe. If we get India on board, we will have the four biggest emitters um, on board for a green uh, recovery. Of course, it will not be easy because we have short term uh, difficulties now with the pandemic, huge difficulties, an unprecedented recession, and it happens to all the countries. So it is very difficult to have solidarity from the advanced countries to the low income and middle income countries. Okay, I'll stop here and let's get the second question. Yeah, so I will be asking a question from the Q&A. Vilmini Kapse asks, will the implementation of the circular chain economy throughout the EU differ as the stability of the economies of the various countries vary to a certain extent? Also, if such variance does exist, how will this affect the sustainability processes? Variance exists because um, the, there is, um, the different countries are at different stages in terms of capacity to implement a circular economy. In, in, circular economy is basically a production model. Uh, so uh, the countries that are more advanced in terms of the uh, production processes and their production processes are also uh, a, a flexible in terms of, uh, of uh, change in, of the design uh, in terms of the ability to uh, capitalize on industrial symbiosis, for example. All these are quite technical issues and uh, the ability to endorse them in a production, um, in a production line uh, has to do with uh, the, uh, the personnel you have, the access to investment funds, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the robustness of the co 
policy framework that can support this and also uh, whether there is finance for this. At the moment, I am involved in a, a few venture capitals that are earmarked on circular economy and they try to give funds for the, uh, the transition of uh, standard production processes into circular production processes. But there we see very clearly that they don't only need funds, they also need consulting. You need to guide them through the whole process because the level of awareness is low. The level of, of, of capacity building that is needed in terms of this is lower in Southern Europe and much more advanced in Central and uh, Northern Europe. Uh, the, the, the good thing about the, um, obviously, if you achieve uh, to implement efficiently circular economy, you reduce your cost of production and you become much more competitive. Not only your cost of production is lower, but the quality of your product in terms of its uh, health effects and in terms of the environmental footprint, it's much better. So you become much more competitive. Uh, so I, I think here it, it is also another point where capacity building should be seriously taken into account and we should invest in um, reskilling and, uh, and upskilling uh, the, the, the business world in order to be able to gain to, to be on board on this sustainability transition and to understand how they can gain for it. Because this sustainability transition is really a win-win situation. Profits can increase, the environmental footprint can decrease and huge health benefits can be realized. So our last question from Antraj. Talking about sustainable finance, would you agree that what most investment banks follow today is greenwashing rather than an actual commitment to environmental goals? Well, you definitely get some of greenwashing, definitely. But uh, let me say that greenwashing um, for me is our fault, whose fault? The fault of the people that work in the sustainability uh, area, and they did not manage to convince the companies that it is in their benefit to have real uh, sustainable investments. If you really uh, propose something that it can increase the company's profit. It can increase the profile, company's profile, especially for companies that are in the stock market. We see that um, the green profile, green and social, what we call um, uh, sustainable um, uh, social governance criteria, we see that these stocks are doing better in the stock exchange. We also see that funds that invest in sustainable investments are the more profitable funds. It has been uh, announced uh, by, uh, by many different um, and credible uh, sources and we see it in our research as well. The fact that somebody is engaged in green goals, it, it, it means that we fail to convince them that a, a real uh, a transition to sustainability is in their benefit in terms of profit and also in terms of being on board in the new era. Because if, you, uh, if uh, we have fossil fuels, if we have a renewable energy becoming cheaper than fossil fuels, then even if you ignore the environmental and health footprint, the financial numbers will leave the market there. And you are better 
been a first uh, comer, uh, uh, you are better if you have the first mover advantage ra rather than coming late into the market. I worked with big oil and gas companies on green projects that were so successful, Enel, Stadoil, uh, and and uh, these companies have issued um, sustainable transition bonds uh, connected with specific SDGs and SDG 13 on climate action and decarbonization, SDG um, uh, 14 on uh, the uh, sustainable use of marine resources, SDG 15 on sustainable use of, uh, of land. And uh, it, uh, these bonds were 25 times oversubscribed. Uh, so it can happen. We need, again, to increase the capacity for real uh, green and digital projects. These are very complementary in their implementation. And we, see, we should see the green um, policies integrated into the smart specialization policies. The two, at least as my research shows, creates a huge positive externalities and they are uh, capable of uh, creating uh, growth uh, stimulus. Thank you so much for your answer. That brings us to the end of the event. A big thank you from the Economist Society and the UCL Department of Economics to Professor Kaundori for taking out your time from your busy schedule to be with us here today. We hope you enjoyed the event. Thank you to Professor Blundell for agreeing to introduce Professor Kaundori. And finally, thank you for, to all of the attendees for being a great audience and for all your questions.